Welcome to part three of my lectures on technical public speaking. In this part, I will go into slide design in a bit more depth. Last time, we talked about making slides readable and some conventions and other things you should know. It was admittedly a rather dry set of rules and useful tips. Today, we're gonna to talk about the more interesting topic of making slides memorable. And also, we'll cover some issues specific for technical presentations. Last year, I came across a website which I really like. It's made by Professor Michael Alley at Penn State University. He calls his method the assertion evidence approach to slide design. I recommend going to the website and checking it out because they have great examples there. The core ideas are the title of the slide is a full sentence, which is the assertion. You put some good visuals, which are the evidence. You build your talk on messages, not topics. And you support these me messages with visual evidence. There should be basically no bullet lists and you put as few words as possible. You explain evidence by choosing the words as you go. So let's explain what this means through some examples. We've already seen this partial example. In the previous lecture, I had this terrible slide that is very wordy. And I converted it to this slide, which is much less wordy, but the title is still a bit useless. You could say that eye tracking glasses is a topic. It does not stand alone as a message. The slide tells you something about eye tracking glasses, but the title of the slide just tells you what the topic is. So we can modify the title like this. Now the title is an assertion. Eye tracking glasses fuse information from two cameras to allow study of gaze behavior. So now the title conveys an assertion about eye tracking glasses and the rest of the slide provides evidence to support that assertion. Here's another example from the previous lecture. Again, this slide is already quite visual, but the title is still just a topic. So I could change the title to an assertion. Best font types for screens and papers are different. One reason this kind of title is better is because there's a reinforcement between the audience member reading the main point and the audience member then hearing the main point as you explain. Another reason is that if an audience member tunes out momentarily, they get distracted, maybe thinking about lunch, and then they tune back in and look at the slide, then right away the title gives them the main point. Here's another example. It's very common in my field to see slides with titles like this. A presenter might have five slides in a row that all have the same title, which is numerical results. That means that 15 to 20% of the slide real estate is doing nothing useful except to tell you that we're now in the results section of the talk. So we can change this to be like this. Now there's an assertion up top. The half duplex relay system has higher throughput than baseline systems at low SNR. That is the main point of showing this plot. So we put the message in the slide title. Here's another example from the last lecture. Again, you can see that the title is just a general topic, not a message. And there's a bullet list with a lot of words. So we can redesign the slide like this. The title is now an assertion. Emitted light from a computer screen usually has higher contrast than reflected light from a projection system. That is the main point, which I was trying to get across with that slide. So I make that main point the title. And the rest is visual no bullet list. It puts a bit more of a burden on me as a speaker to remember what I was going to say about the slide, but still the pictures cue me pretty well. As a last example, you might recall this wall of text slide from the last lecture. They've got a bunch of results numbers down there, but they're kind of buried. So last time we did some redesigning like this. And you can see that it's easier to compare the numbers when they are lined up like this. But the assertion evidence approach would call for additional changes. The title of the slide is still a topic, not a message. So we can change the title to give an assertion. And then we replace the list of numbers with a visual like this. Now the title says, 
Preference-based RAN caching and scheduling improves the probability of meeting initial delay requirements. And the list of numbers has been turned into a bar chart. So these examples give you the basic idea of the assertion evidence approach to slide design. I recommend you go to the source at the assertion evidence website and see the examples and explanations there. One slide we haven't talked about so far is the title slide. Your title slide should have all the basics with your title, your name, your affiliation, your collaborators, the title of the event, and so forth. It should also have some pictures. It should not be boring because it might be sitting up on the screen for some time while you're getting introduced. Here's an example. The pictures give you some hints of what the subject is about. And then I've got some text for the main pieces. Now we're on the last part, talking about some issues specific for technical content. You should define all the terms that you use in equations. It's not enough to just say them out loud. You should also write them on the slide. Here's an example of a slide where most of the terms in the equations are not defined on the slide. Here's another example where all the terms are defined. This is not necessarily the best way of doing it because your eyes have to go back and forth from top to bottom to see what the definitions are, but at least all the terms are defined. It's a good idea where possible to show the scale of things in your pictures. This first picture shows a rock, but you can't tell how big it is. The second picture shows you the scale. For small components, it's common to put something like a penny or a ruler in the picture in order to show scale. Be careful with how many significant figures you put. Putting too many is a bad idea in a paper, but it's even worse for a slide because the audience has limited time to process visually what's on the screen. Here's an example where a person did five fold cross validation and they are reporting accuracy separately for each fold and the extra digits are meaningless at a certain point. So if you need to show this kind of data, then truncate it. Here's a related problem where the students are reporting the number of pixels which are misclassified. And these are really difficult numbers to grasp at a glance. If you look at this number, you might start reading it as 178,000. And then you might notice that it's actually 1.78 million. So there's clearly too much useless precision here. And the numbers should be rounded off and put in scientific notation, or maybe expressed as percents. Let's talk about plots. You need to label the axes clearly. You're going to say them out loud, but you also need to have them labeled. Don't have too many curves. And it's a good idea to use color to distinguish curves, but also distinguish them some other way, using dashes or dots or so forth. If you know that you're going to refer to something, then mark it with an arrow. Legends are not always the best way to label curves because the viewer's eyes must go back and forth. So let's see some examples. These are bad plots. There are too many curves. They are all the same cover, color. Well, actually, there's two colors. There's blue and black. And the axis labels are too small. This is a much better plot. The axis labels are now larger and there are only three curves, and the curves are distinguished both by color and by markers. If I know in advance that I'm going to refer to something, for example, the place where the blue and red curves cross, then I should mark it with an arrow. On this example, there are five curves, and three of them are black with small markers, so they're a bit hard to distinguish. And with the legend in the corner, the viewer has to look back and forth to try to figure out what is what. So I can label things with names and arrows like this. In fact, I can even get rid of the legend on this one and simplify the labels, because in this case, I don't actually need to distinguish the two baseline algorithms from each other. 
And I don't need to distinguish the three visibility-based algorithms from one another either. So this would be a simpler way to show it. Here's a slide from a student presentation. The axis labels are too small, again. Also, the students know that there are certain regions of the curve that they are going to point out, so they should mark them. Here's an improved version of the slide where the three plots have large labels on them to the left. Also, the regions of interest where the dog is standing still or turning are marked, so it's easy for the speaker to refer to them. When you present a plot, there's basically a formula that you need to follow. You say what quantities are on the X and Y axes. You say what the ranges are. You can skip this for the second time that you're presenting the same type of plot. If it's not obvious, say whether higher or lower represents better or worse or whatever. Again, you can skip this if it's the same type of plot as before. You can skip it for the second time. Say what all the curves are. If some curves are not important and you are not planning to mention them, then remove them from the plot. Here's an example. If I were presenting this, I would say, this plot shows bit reduction rate on the x-axis ranging from 0 to 20%, and the video quality metric is on the y-axis ranging from 0 0.05 to 0 0.45. For the video quality metric, higher up means worse quality. The black curve is the baseline method of dropping frames, and it does the worst. And the other curves are the three flavors of perceptually based dropping methods. So there you have an example of following the formula. I said what's on the x and y axes and what the ranges are, and that higher up means worse quality, and I mentioned the curves. Moving on to block diagrams. You should use color and shape to help you organize. For example, the inputs could all be one color and the outputs could be another color. Make sure the fonts are large enough. You can generally make a font large enough to fill the whole box. You often see someone label a box like this when they should be doing this. Put the start at the left or the top if you possibly can. And it's important to make the shapes and colors of boxes and arrows mean something consistent, such as the type of connection, the type of data, or the type of operation. Here is a problematic block diagram. This project is about a system that has some sensors to monitor a dog. And the system sends information about the dog to the owner's phone. One problem with the diagram is that the fonts are too small. All the fonts should be bigger. A second problem is that the dog is the natural starting point for explaining this diagram, but the dog is located down here. And the data ends up coming to the owner's phone, but the phone is up here. And you kind of want the starting point to be up and to the left and have the end point be down or to the right. A third problem is that while a red arrow means the circuit power, the solid black arrow does not mean something consistent. In some places, a solid black arrow represents data flow, and in other places, it represents where sensors are physically located on the dot. So here's a partial redesign. We've moved the dog to the left. So the dog is the starting point for explaining things. Then we have the two sensors in purple boxes and the font is larger than before. The blue arrows indicate where the sensors are located, one on the ear and the other on the collar. We have red arrows representing power and black arrows representing data flow. And we have the phone on the far right as the endpoint where the data ends up. There's a formula for presenting block diagrams as well. If you have different colors or shapes, then say what the different colors or shapes represent. Walk through all the boxes in the diagram. Depending on the complexity, you may want to start with a high level view first. For example, saying this section does the video processing, this section does the communications and so forth and then go into detail. Here's an example of a simple linear diagram. 
If I were presenting this, I would just go in order. We start with an original video and that passes through the video encoder, which compresses it. Next, it goes through the channel encoder, which adds redundancy. Then it goes through the network where nodes may be congested and some packets have to get dropped. At the receiver side, it first goes through the channel decoder, which attempts to correct bit errors, then the video decoder, which decompresses it. And finally, we end up with the compressed and reconstructed video with losses. Here's another example. And for this one, we might explain by groups initially. The blue ovals represent the sensor inputs, which go to the microcontroller. And the green triangles represent the things which can be controlled by the system, the lights and the fan and so forth. The orange boxes represent the data flow to the cloud. Then I might go into detail on the functioning of separate items. In this case, some of the black uh, words are also written too small here. You might be asking, why is she spending so much time on slide design? Bad slide design can trap you in bad delivery because you're stuck reading it or because you get lost looking at your wall of text. And it can be unreadable by the audience and annoying. Good slide design, on the other hand, gives you confidence and helps you deliver well. And it helps the audience understand and remember what you said. Here's a quick recap of the main points from part three. The title of a slide should be a sentence that gives the main message. The, sh the slide should have visual evidence that supports the assertion made in the title. Don't have very many words. Professor Michael Alley at Penn State has a very useful website on this subject. Then we talked about some issues for technical slides. You need to define terms in your equations and show scale in your pictures if the scale is relevant and not obvious. Don't put ex extra useless digits of precision. Your plots should be supported with axis labels, use of color and arrows to mark things that you need to refer to. Block diagrams should be presented in order with colors and shapes that have consistent meanings. And that's the end of part three. Next time, I'll be talking about voice usage. I'm Pamela Cosman, and thank you for joining me.